Hi everyone. We're going to um, get moving again. We're doing weeks 12, 13 um, of your advanced canine and feline nutrition course. We're talking today about eating behavior and weight management. This is part one where um, we tried to break up last week's lecture this week and then um, my kind of part two of this so that these videos are not so long and so that um, hopefully you're thinking a little bit about each video in between. So eating behavior, weight management, and first, um, before we, as a nutritionist, as an animal owner, as a veterinarian, as whatever we want to be, the first thing we have to understand is what is normal eating behavior? And I have a slide in a few seconds, but um, there, are some, there are some differences amongst individuals for this as well. But quickly, um, for this one, in general, from our ancestral traits for canines, um, from wolves, from um, similar canids, how do our, our normal canines eat? Um, so they are intermittent eater, eaters. So that means that they, um, they gorge immediately after a kill. There are some references that say that dogs um, and wolves naturally eat 16% of their body weight um, when they are feral, free-ranging animals because they may not eat again um, for an extended period of time. So um, instinctually, a lot of these animals are gorgers. Some breeds, some individuals still may exhibit this behavior in dogs. Certainly not all of them, but some, some do. Dogs can usually adjust to different feeding styles and are very happy to do it. But once in a while, we have behaviorally a gorger, um, and, and there can be issues with that that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, ancestrally, there's also competition between members of a pack. So there could be very rapid consumption of food by a submissive animal who is fearful that a dominant animal will come and take the food from it. Or it could be um, a dominant animal who eats um, too much, overeats, uh, because of the, the same very fear that they don't want the submissive animals there. And of course you can have extremely submissive animals who will choose never to eat to their detriment. Um, they only eat when nobody else is there, and they could be um, very thin or very unhealthy because of the fear of the dominant animal. So that could require careful management of feeding um, in households. Again, normally that competition between members is minor enough that the normal household doesn't worry so much about it. But once in a while, there's a situation where we have to think nutrition and behavior go hand in hand, and we have to make sure that we're complementing both of them so that the people in the house are, are happy and the animals in the house are happy. So we're talking about members of the pack here. So do remember that um, that pack can include you and your cat and your dog. It hasn't just got to be the canine individuals. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. A normal ancestral trait is also food hoarding. I'm sure some of you have had dogs that go and um, bury a bone or bury some food, and they ancestrally ate it at a later time. Our dogs, um, what we often see now is that they will go and they will bury it, but they don't often go back and find it ever again or even dig it up. They might, but it's almost as if it's an accident later on. Um, so that is an ancestral trait. Some breeds do it more than others. Some dog types do it more than others. Um, the real concern there is if they really were to eat something that um, was bacteria ridden. But, um, but again, it's not um, that one I don't worry about as much as the first two. So that's how they normally ate and how do we deal with that and how are their eating problems associated with that? So canines, if they eat too rapidly, um, you might hear this referred to as scoffing or bolting their food. That can cause the dog to choke. It can cause them to swallow large amounts of air, which of course can lead some breeds to bloat-like conditions or gastric torsion. Um, it can cause them to swallow treats whole and they may get stuck or impacted, um, or have a gulping behavior of other items, which could again um, cause them to swallow things they shouldn't be swallowing. So eating rapidly may be somewhat normal, but um, Determining what is too rapid for your animal and trying to find a way to slow it down is often recommended. The social facilitation, so um, that rate of consumption and resource guarding. So 
do you have animals that are eating abnormally because of other animals in their pack? And is that um, affecting the lifestyle of the animal or the lifestyle of any individual? So um, is your dog a threat to your cat if your cat walks by the food bowl at a certain time? Um, is your dog a threat to your child? Um, is one of your dogs not eating because of another dog? And I'm saying you and your, but as you know from this class, I'm not so much talking about you and your really as much as I am you giving advice to someone else in, in, your, in their home. Because I, all of us at this level we are animal scientists and we are going to be um, to some degree an expert at this field comparatively to some of our peers and they may be asking for advice. So again, not so much about what happens in your home, but how can you help other canids have lifelong homes by making sure that their consumption is leading for them to have a healthy lifestyle and um, a healthy social network. Some of the treatments that we might have for an eating problem such as this would be trying to change rates of eating. We talked about that early on with, um, with bloat and um, trying to get the dogs to, to eat slower. And that can be getting different sizes of kibble that the animal can't gulp as easy, adding water to food so they actually have to slow down, um, and then usually specially designed bowls that um, make, make it harder to get to the food and make them slow down. And that slowing down isn't slowing down by minutes. That's slowing down really probably by seconds, but it's still enough that it's, um, it's helping that animal. And then it could be behavior training. If there's issues between dogs eating in the same household, you may be training dogs to eat from their own bowls, feeding at separate times, feeding in separate rooms. The danger with, um, with making them eat individually is that um, in situations where that's not possible, so traveling, um, having relatives over, that kind of thing, you just, um, if anything comes out of the norm, you don't want that to be a dangerous situation for your animals or for your, anyone in your family. So um, it, training them to um, respect each other and, and understand that proper order of eating is definitely the best, but it can be hard, and therefore sometimes we do have to get people to feed separately. But getting them to understand that proper eating behavior early on as soon as you can really is the best. Instead of trying to adjust to their problem, stopping the problem is, is definitely the most recommended. But um, again, that's more for a behavior class than, than a nutrition class. But I, I will say that the more you fix the problem early on, the better. Um, just this morning, I was reading about a German Shepherd that killed a two-week-old baby. Um, and it just so happened that the baby was near a food, a food bowl. I have no idea the dynamics. It was a quick blip online. Um, I, I have no idea about the dog, the family, whatever. Clearly, there's a lot of issues there. That small of a child should never left, be left with any animal. Um, and I, I don't know what's happening, but I, I will say that um, animals and food bowls can be a tricky situation, and we should make sure that we do as much to make sure that that animal is safe around its own food bowl and everybody else. Um, eating should be a good experience for the animals and for their owners. So anyway, enough said on that one. Um, the list of potential eating and feeding concerns in canines is long. Um, so we have overeaters, we have undereaters, um, we have animals who can become anorexic. We have social eaters. We have dogs that um, have suffered terribly from separation anxiety and only will eat if their family is home. It doesn't matter how much food they have there, they won't eat until you come in the door. Um, or they want to eat when their human is eating, even if they've eaten already that day. So. Um, they are a social being and we are social beings. So we can understand that. We just have to find a way to work around it. Um, certainly separation anxiety is its own um, bag of worms. And again, that's something that um, would be better for an animal behavior class. But trying to um, treat that and prevent that clearly will help a lot of eating problems. We have pica in dogs. Um, that's when they're eating things that they really shouldn't eat. Some pica may be because of nutritional deficiencies. Um, that's probably a minority of the, the true pica issues that we see, but it would, could be um, an animal in the wild eating clay because they need some of the minerals in that. But 
normally what we see with dogs is a a dog excessively licking carpet or trying to eat carpet or wood or um, some non-nutrient type item, paper, um, the backs of books. And again, it can be dangerous for what they consume because they might not be able to get rid of it. But I'm going to talk about the causes of that more in a second. Um, certainly feces eating, so eating poop is a concern. There are species that do um, seek a trophy where they have to eat a special type of feces um, from their own rectum because of the, the B vitamins that their body creates in the large intestine that the animal can't absorb. So rabbits, guinea pigs, degu, those animals do seek true seek a trophy where they're, they um, actually, it's like they produce their own little vitamin pellet and it goes, it's a constant loop. Dogs are not like that. When a dog eats feces, Typically, it is a um, behavioral issue, it is a smell issue, it's a dominance issue. Um, kind of depending on your dog, which one of those is, um, it just could be um, fun. I mean, that it's a different smelly thing. They don't have the social parameters that we do. It's something that we don't want them to do, though, just because of disease, parasites, you name it. So, lots of issues that we see with feeding concerns in canines. These conditions can result from a whole plethora of reasons. So um, if you are giving someone advice about their animal and they're telling you they have a four-year-old dog who just recently started having pica or just recently started eating poop, uh, you may want to recommend them having a full vet check on that animal. You, it could very well be that that is some type of disease that is causing this issue. If they say the animal's been doing it since they got it at birth, then um, it's probably behavioral and it's a... It's a um, while it might be difficult to solve, it's probably something that um, doesn't necessarily need the veterinarian to, to attend to it. But these conditions can come from age. It can be that the dog is want attention. They can be bored. Um, it can be disease, whether that's genetic disease, bacterial disease, viral disease, um, you name it, hormonal. I mean, whatever it is, it, it, it could be any type of disease that's altering how they taste the food, how they enjoy the food, um, their desire to eat the food. It can be human interactions. We talk about um, separation anxiety and social eaters, but it can be um, mistakes that we make with the animal where maybe they're um, very high strung and we have scared them around the food for some way, shape, or form. Or maybe it's a rescue animal or a foster animal. And um, we, again, have um, just put them in a situation that makes it fearful for them to, to eat in a correct manner. It can be medications that they're consuming. Um, kind of already, a lot of these already allude to stress, but certainly there are many conditions that lead to our animals having what we would consider eating problems. Patience um, is hard for, for us, and I am, I am, I know that I'm not the world's most patient being and I think that a lot of us are the same way. We recognize the problem. We know it's not um, not easy to fix, but yet somehow we still don't have the patience to wait for that resolution. And um, we just have to remind ourselves constantly that a two-year-old dog didn't develop that behavior we want to fix overnight. It's going to take time for us to, to convince that animal um, that our way is better and our convincing may take us, patients, and, um, and other people's advice, behavior advice, nutrition advice, you name it, to, to finding a solution to make that animal's um, eating behavior stop or at least slow it down such that they live a healthier life and that, again, the family lifestyle is, um, is better for everyone involved. Our goal as a nutritionist, as a companion animal expert or manager, is to um, keep our companion animals in homes for their entire life. And the more that we do to, that makes that human-animal bond closer and better, um, the better it is for the animal. And um, nutrition is a part of that. Normal eating behavior for felines. Um, so this is your, uh, your Felis livica and, and some of our the other small cat potential ancestors. They eat lots of little meals all throughout the day. I typically say that our average cat, um, our average free-ranging cat, eats 13 meals per day. 
Um, so the range here in your text is 9 to 16 meals per day. And these are small meals, so it could be um, a small frog, it could be a small bird egg, whatever it is, lots of little meals throughout the day, and they hunt for each one of those things. So that is a, um, they, they hunt, they hunt alone, they find it, they eat it, they consume it, and they're active all throughout the day. So they tend to eat a little more slowly, um, there's not as much competition, and that's kind of their natural thing. Lots of little active meals throughout the day. And of course, lots of little naps to, to kind of catch up with that. The list of potential eating concerns for cats um, is, is not as common as you see in dogs. It's partly because, um, as we talked about earlier, the cats just more recently moved into the home with us. While they um, are in the home with us more now, it's only been in the last roughly 20 to 30 years that we have had true indoor cats with us all the time. Prior to that, uh, we didn't really see what was happening. They, they ate a lot outside, they ate some inside, and we just didn't understand it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the potential eating concerns for cats, if we don't start working on finding a solution, probably will get worse, not better, um, because we, um, again, we are just having more and more cats in smaller living situations with us with less, um, less outdoor activities. And while that's a wonderful human-cat relationship thing, it can, it can certainly lead to nutritional and behavior problems. So cats do reportedly overkill more than they overconsume. Um, that certainly can be an issue. Our feral cats get themselves in a lot of media negative attention. Um, we don't have to discuss that here because I'm sure that, that um, it's somewhat of a, a heated topic, but our cats are typically very healthy little carnivores. And if they're allowed feral, they will, they, they do what cats are supposed to do, and that is um, kill and eat. And they will, they will overkill. Historically, they have not overconsumed so much, um, but they can. They can undereat and they can overeat. Gulping cats, much like dogs, can lead to um, vomiting. It can lead to gastritis. It can lead to some social dominance concerns, or one cat more aggressive to another, or a cat even being aggressive to a dog. Um, again, we don't see this as much as we do with dogs, but it certainly can happen. Um, on the flip side of that, we can see cats who have um, that cats can be very conservative eaters, much more so than dogs. Um, we link them more closely to birds here with, um, with, their, with their real picky eating style. Cats have been known to actually eat, to, to starve themselves to the point where they um, become very sick, often arginine-related concerns, um, or they, they can die from just not eating. So true anorexia, true not eating can be a concern in cats. Um, Again, it's often affiliated with some other underlying condition, but it can, it can be social in nature. Pica is much less common in cats, but there is some genetic breed links. Um, if you look in the literature, Siamese exotics and um, Siamese exotics, your Devon Rex, your Cornish Rex, and, um, and your Persians. Those are the ones that we often hear more about um, having some pica related issues. Sometimes it's wool sucking, sometimes it's some um, shiny object licking or um, consumption. I don't know uh, the real science behind this or if there is any science behind it. I will just say that when you look at the literature, and I'm not talking peer reviewed literature here, I'm just talking your social literature. Um, when you see cats with excessive, primarily the wool sucking, blanket um, sucking, or, um, or like shiny metal licking issues, um, it does tend to be more those breeds or those breed types. Of course, any cat can do it, and that can be harmful for the animal if they're consuming it. Um, if they're just licking it or just sucking on it, um, my behaviorist friends have told me that's probably not that big of a deal as long as it's not made of anything toxic. Um, it is an odd behavior, but even as humans, some of us have odd behaviors. As long as it's not health detrimental, it may not be something you have to worry about. Poop consumption can be an issue in cats. Again, it's much less common, partly because of the litter boxes and because um, but it really is just the litter box issue. It can occur. What we see more often than that is um, some litter consumption. If a cat is trying to consume their litter, whatever it is, um, we often suggest changing litter types. 
and if um, they won't stop it to then use paper litter or something that they can't actually pass through. But um, again, it's not what I would consider a, a normal concern. As with dogs, these conditions can result from a plethora of reasons, age, um, boredom, attention-seeking, disease, human interactions again, just like we said before, um, and medication stress, and um, just resolution finding. I should say here with medications, um, we know this in humans, and it makes sense in, in animals, maybe not the cat as much as the dog, but some medications change our taste buds. For example, um, there's some cancer medications, um, some types of chemo, some types of radiation, and some other medications that actually um, completely alter taste buds. They actually make some sour taste buds um, more likely to taste sweet and vice versa. It really depends on the medication and what happens. Um, so it's likely that these medications can do the same thing for animals. So um, there is, if an animal is on a medication, has just had a vaccine, um, is newly diagnosed with a disease, and their um, interest in food goes down, in general, that's not a huge concern because um, ours would too. It's only a huge concern if it stays that way and if they truly are not eating or they're starting to lose weight. Um, a cat reminder, cats in general tend to drink less water. They would naturally get more water um, from, from their carnivorous diet. And if they're eating a, um, a very dry diet, then we do need to make sure that we're monitoring their water consumption. The less water they drink, the more likely they are to develop some other conditions, stones being one of them, um, ur you know, urinary stones. So we want to make sure that they are getting drinking plenty of water or have a diet that's moist. So it kind of depends on your cat and their needs, whether you feed them a dry food or a wet food. Um, as we've discussed, there can be um, positive reasons for, for either, either of those types of diet depending on, on what you want to do. Um, so in cats and dogs, normal eating patterns are individual specific, so an owner should know their pet's normal. If you do happen to be that practicing clinician one day, whether it's again a veterinary, nutritionist, whatever, and you're talking to the owner of an animal, um, listen to them. Listen to what they say is their cat's normal, their dog's normal, because they have been the one who's watched that animal um, day in, day out, consuming food. If they seem to him and haw on that, what you might want to do is send them home and say, okay, for the next week, measure out what your animal eats, measure back in what it didn't eat, get a little scale, write it down, watch what they're doing, how they're doing it, so they actually know more about it. We make assumptions about what um, we eat ourselves, but also make assumptions about our animals. Sometimes just weighing it in and out for a couple of days just tells us so much more about our animal. So sometimes um, very simple advice is what we need for these animals. Just, um, just what is their animal really doing? The owner should know it better than anybody else. But at the same time, they might need to be encouraged to, to write these things down so they actually um, understand a little bit more. How many calories are really going in? How many calories are really coming out? Do they like it? Do they don't like it? Um, what's really happening? Um, I've even recommended before um, video cameras, actually getting a little bit of a camera and watching what happens in the day while you're gone. Um, they're, they're so cheap now, um, it really is a, an easy way to, to help, I guess, with peace of mind if someone's worried about it. So age, teeth, disease, breed type stress. Um, stress could be moving to a new location, um, just going to the vet, dry, riding in a car, new animals, new smells. Um, uh, an apartment neighbor whose dog is barking all the time, a storm that happened the day before, or a storm was coming that night, um, limited outside access, or all that. All these things can matter to our animals, and we have to remember that when their eating patterns change. Because again, some diet alterations are normal, just like us. Some days we're more hungry, some days we're less hungry. Some days we exercise more, some days we exercise less. So again, we just have to think about what are we doing, why are we doing it, and, and what makes sense. So body condition scoring, so BCS scoring system, um, is how we look at our animal to determine uh, are, they, are they a healthy size. And 
we, we do have ranges for dogs and cats for the breeds and breed types and I've done work with this um, for a company and I've, I've looked at average heights and weights and um, for cats and dogs over I think now 800 some breeds and breed types and breed mixes and I will tell you that we have a lot of great numbers for that but there's always that animal that's on the low end of the scale or the high end of the scale or short or whatever and the body condition scoring really is the best guide. I, um, I like using the Purina body condition scoring system, um, not because it's Purina, but because they have these nice pictures, they explain it well. I personally like the body condition scoring system of one through nine, because um, there are some that go through one, one to five. I just like the one through nine better. I think it gives you, as a clinician, um, more information to explain to an owner or our clientele about how to look at the animal. I, um, on this diagram here, you see this is a one. You see that that animal is just super, super thin. Um, there is a, a huge cave in here. You see all the ribs. Um, that's a one. So that could be that could be animal abuse. That could be um, an older animal who just doesn't like to eat could be over exercising we can't judge that all we can say is that is that is very thin then you go one up to a number three here and um, and your three is um, from the top down you can no longer see the ribs um, as pronounced you see them a little bit and you can you can read through here they're easily palpated um, you can't see any fat you certainly the animal looks thin but it's certainly a big step up then we go in down to our number five, and our five is almost lost to that waist, if you see it. It's, um, but it is still kind of, my line's crooked, sorry guys. It's still kind of flat through here, and then it comes up that way. You, you want a tuck, and that's right here. You want to see a tuck in the animal, and you can see a kind of little tuck right here. That's really what we're looking for. You want to be able to, um, if you touch the top of the animal, you want to be able to easily feel um, their their ribs, but also their vertebrae, and that's um. And so again, you you see that here. What we really want our our dog to be that you know perfect dog would be about a 4.5. Um, not that many dogs are 4.5, but somewhere between four and five is okay. We really do like the four and a half a little bit better. So. Kind of like this, maybe a little bit more tuck right there. That's kind of our perfect, our perfect dog. Moving down, um, so you kind of see the number five again. All of a sudden, with your number seven, um, you have um, you have fatty deposits here, and you can see those. Um, so you have the fat cover. There's no tuck at all. See, so you, you see that it's just one big long line there, and then fatty deposits here, and a little bit of waste there. Then we get down to our nine, so eight to a nine, all of a sudden the back end is larger than the front end. And um, that shouldn't happen. This is the first time that you've noticed that that's actually happened. Even in your seven, that hasn't happened. So when you're starting to look more like pear-shaped, if you will, um, that is a, that's a big problem. You're starting to have the fat deposits underneath, and the legs, and the neck, and um, that is a, a big issue. So way too heavy. Nine would be, um, again, animal cruelty, animal abuse. One could be animal cruelty, animal abuse. We Again, we don't know that for certain. It could be animals that um, have medical reasons for being so small or so heavy. But it's definitely um, very concerning when they get to be that heavy. So if you're judging a lab body type, those these body condition scores I just showed you are wonderful. But if you're judging a Saluki or a Whippet or a Greyhound, or conversely, a St. Bernard or a Mastiff, all of a sudden these, these tables that I'm showing you are, um, are just not um, so great anymore because the body style changes. Purina and most of the other groups that put out these um, public body condition scoring for public consumption are putting it out there in a lab type because the labs are so very popular throughout the world and um, lab types are popular, and many of our other types of dogs have that same body style. But if you, again, are that clinician and you're trying to give people advice for your animal, you do want to make sure that, um, that you have some, whether hand-drawn or pictures or whatever, where you can show what is a heavy um, um, 
racing type dog style? What is what is one for a uh, a more mountain or working style dog? And what I often recommend for um, new veterinarians, for example, would just be a photo book. Um, ask your clients if they're willing to let you take pictures of their animals, and and you have your own body condition scoring for popular breeds at your practice. So your English Bulldog, your Pug, your uh, your Poodle, whatever it is, have your own little book and let your clients look through it and um, make sure they're okay with you using the pictures, but put numbers on it and, and say, you know, hey, this is a one, and if you want to justify and make your clients feel good, you can say, this was a seven. Um, he was a seven because he was 11 years old and um, had severe arthritis and couldn't go for walks anymore, but this is what a seven looks like. You don't have to get all that detailed, but you do want to just um, to let them know something. So finally, um, on this slide, is our average accept normal, not truly normal? That is a, that's a huge concern. Um, what we're seeing right now is that, just like with people, you know, our average dress size used to be whatever, I don't know, a six or eight, and now we're seeing the average dress size being um, 12 plus or, or whatever. I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I do know that in humans, um, certainly our average dress sizes have changed, and even um, a size six in the 40s would be like a size 12 now, but it, so it's, so it's, um, we have changed what we considered normal for humans. We've also changed what we consider normal for animals. This is an article by, um, by a, a group online, and I mean, it's a media article, and take it for what you will, but the picture is real. And this is a Labrador retriever. Um, I believe it was in like the 1960s. This guy here, um, they called him Briggs. And this was a, a huge winning level retriever. And that's what the breed standard was written to. The breed standard hasn't changed since this animal won best in show. Well, this is an animal that won um, around, I think it was um, 2014, if I remember correctly. Um, and so with this guy, you can see that Labrador Retriever, who won Best in Show there, is a much heavier animal. There is some tuck here, but nowhere near the same tuck as there. I mean, certainly more fat padding. That's a shorter animal. Um, why is the Best in Show changing? And why is it a heavier animal? And does it matter? Um, so is that, is that a problem? And is it a problem that we are um, accepting heavier animals as the normal? So. How are we saying, hey, a six is is normal instead of that four and a half? And that's, um, that is a huge concern for some practitioners. I, as some of you know, my brother is a veterinarian, and, um, and he has had that conversation with some of his new vet friends where they would look at a dog and they're like, oh, gosh, that dog is so thin. We should put some weight on it. He's like, no, that, that's normal. That, that is our, our normal dog. And um, it's just what you're used to seeing. Um, here's another article. This is from um, a canine nutrigenics book, nutrigenomics book. I have to say, I like parts of this book. I don't like all of it, so I'm not necessarily saying go and get it, because um, I, I don't agree with some of the, the vaccination and some of the, um, some of the other advice in the book as much as I do with um, this part. And that's just that it's um, this first paragraph is that. Um, it's time to get serious to help your canine curb the battle of the bulge. He'll not only feel better, he'll be happier and healthier. Um, and so this one here is where I'm kind of getting you guys to look now. And that's, since dog and cat parents often have a skewed image of their companion's weight, we love them. So our adoring eyes don't judge them the same. So it's nice to have a scale that actually takes that um, human element out of it. And that's this body condition scoring that we're talking about. And again, I personally prefer the nine point scale. And like I said, I, I prefer the 4.5 as optimal, although 4.5 to five is really hard for most people to, to really indicate. So um, again, just trying to show you that a few people who agree on, um, on some of these concepts. Um, body condition scoring in cats. The way a, a heavy cat looks is quite different than the way a heavy dog looks. So again, read through the numbers. Ideal is somewhere around the five. Um, where cats start to show their weight typically is, is underneath a lot more than, um, than the dogs do. So um, 
you see a pretty slim, um, a tiny bit of a waistline cat here, but it's starting to get a little bit of um, a tiny little pad maybe. Um, where you see this cat, you can see all the ribs on, on these up here. I'm sure a lot of you have seen new kittens that look like this that have just been wormed or whatever, and they're, they're slowly um, coming into themselves. As you go on the next slide, um, you'll see, um, well, this was the five we just looked at, but now you're looking at a seven. And all of a sudden, um, your cat's got a, a wide girth here, but then you have a sag here. If this animal is actually walking, it would sway. So um, that is a concern. And then, um, of course, your nine is that the big gut, and then again, the huge sway underneath. Um, there are p fat pads around the neck too. It's just harder. It's harder to see that on this diagram. The fortunate thing about the body condition scoring things that we see for cats is that um, cat body types don't differ as much as dog body types. So we don't have to necessarily do the same pictures for body um, cat styles the way we do with dogs. Um, other than some of our really furry cats can look heavier than they really are. Um, of course, that's true in dogs as well. Um, I was reading a funny article today when I was preparing this lecture, and it showed a dog that had um, lost six pounds or something like that, and um, it was supposed to be an 18-pound dog, and he had lost six pounds. And anyway, they're all excited about it. Well, the first picture, all you can see of the dog is um, fur everywhere, and um, you name it. And the second picture, they've groomed him and they've like sheared him all off, and um, and it's a marketing website, and they're trying to get you to feed a certain product. But the dog probably lost it six pounds just in fur with somebody shearing it. So um, you do need to actually get your hands on the animal, touch it, um, see if you can feel the ribs, feel, feel the, the fat deposits, what's there. Um, the Maine Coon does look a little different than, say, the Somali or some of those cat breeds. But for the most part, um, the body style is the same. We do have a few cat breeds that will overeat more than others. But um, again, the way they look when they do overeat is pretty similar. I, um, this is my last slide for this lecture, and this kind of leads into our lectures that will that I will put my last lecture, which will be coming up soon. But the public awareness suffers from what we call a fat gap. According to the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention, 45.3% of cat owners and 45.8% of dog owners assess their pet pet as normal weight when their veterinarian assess those animals at being a minimum of overweight. This was a Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association news um, link. This is actually, I think, from 2014. Um, they think there has been um, some improvement here. People are starting to understand that um, cats have problems uh, and dogs have problems and starting to understand that our perception may be somewhat skewed. So I think these 45 numbers may be lower than that now. But still, that fat gap exists. Um, we love them, and we don't, we don't want there to be a problem. But um, we can't fix a problem if we don't recognize it, and that's kind of where we're at. When we, as a clinician, are talking to someone about their animal being heavy, we're not talking, um, we're not judging the person. We are, um, we are just trying to make the animal healthy, and that's what, um, that's what we really have to make sure everyone understands. And I will tell you that that's not um, always easy to do. I'm going to um, click on this link here, and I'll kind of um, we'll talk about this for a second. There's a um, let's see, let's get this advertisement. But you see these cats, and and the people in the background are laughing. I mean, look how heavy they are. Um, these animals can't fit through normal doors. I always get a question about cats and their heads and their whiskers, if our head can fit through it, if their whole body can. Clearly, you can see from this video, that's not the case. Um, it's funny, people are laughing at it, but um, these fat cats, as we'll talk about in the next lecture, um, it really isn't funny, and I laughed the first time I watched this too, and you can't help but look somewhat with some of these cats doing this, but it really is sad. And as that JAVMA paper I just talked about um, discusses, um, most veterinarians have never seen a fat cat like this that wasn't loved. People love it. They just need, um, they need to understand that this is going to make their animal's life less comfortable and shorter. And that's, and that's it. And 
Um, and I showed these little U YouTube links because we, um, they really are, they really are everywhere. You can take that cat and you get a million different pictures and, and yeah, it, it's entertaining on Facebook or whatever, but um, these animals need our help and we need to realize that it's, it's really not that funny. And um, for some reason we don't laugh at dogs the same way we do with cats, but, um, but we still kind of chuckle sometimes when we see that Dotson's tummy is hitting the floor or the basset hound who's swaying. Um, we need to understand that um, we, we don't laugh when we see animals that have been starved. We shouldn't laugh when we see animals that um, have had this happen. So again, um, that's just kind of um, the, the caveat for the thing that, you know, it, we, we need to be more serious about these animals and, and what's happening to them. This is the um, world's fattest cats. Um, and so again, it's kind of a link showing you um, some of the, the fattest ones. And who knows what really is the fattest cat. Um, but you look at these pictures and who knows what's been um, edited or changed or whatever. But clearly these animals are way too heavy. In fact, um, so the Guinness Book of World Records and some other companies have stopped allowing submissions for smallest animal, largest animal, fattest, and that kind of stuff because they felt like it was potentially encouraging people to feed them correctly or, or to do things that um, they didn't necessarily understand was heavy, I mean, was bad. So, um, so again, certainly we need to make sure that um, these people who love animals and clearly their owners love them too, we want to make sure that um, we're helping the family stay together longer and be happier. So anyway, that is the end of my lecture. Sorry it ran a little bit long. Hope you enjoyed the YouTube and um, I will talk to you again sometime soon. Take care.